Shalom and welcome to the Vibe of the Tribe podcast from JewishBoston.com. I'm Miriam Anzevin, and I am here with a very, very special guest. He is the original founder and now editor of this very podcast. He is the host of Pod for Good, a podcast for people who want to do good in the world. He is the CEO of Rant Night Productions and our good friend, it's Jesse Ulrich. Welcome back to the pod, Jesse. Miriam, I am beyond excited to do on this podcast what I originally wanted to do with the podcast in the first place, which is talk about nerdy stuff and also mix in some juice stuff. So. That is that is right. We're really playing to our strengths in this episode, uh, because as we have hitherto established very firmly on this podcast numerous times, we are both massive nerds, both of sci-fi and fantasy and of Judaism. So, I mean, Jesse, I find it kind of hard to believe, but this year marks the 20th anniversary of the release of The Lord of the Rings, The Fellowship of the Ring movie. It's one of the most iconic fantasy films of all time, a movie that I saw five times, a measly five times in theaters. So on today's episode, we are going to talk all about our perception of the works of author J.R.R. Tolkien through a Jewish lens and investigate the very real influence that Judaism and Jewish history had on Tolkien's unparalleled world building. And if we time it correctly, this episode will be released on September 22nd, which is, of course, Bilbo and Frodo's birthday. Happy birthday to both of them. Yes. So now, Jesse, let's go back a little bit. When did you first read Lord of the Rings? And how old were you when you saw the movie? And uh, how obsessed were slash are you? So like, almost my entire childhood was a build up to the Lord of the Rings. I I was read The Hobbit as a child and loved it, and I remember it being read to me many times, but what I truly remember is watching the 70s uh, Hobbit cartoon hundreds of times in my life, over and over and over again. Like, other kids would watch Sesame Street, I would watch the Hobbit cartoon. Those lame children. Yeah. Other kids would watch, uh, you can't do this on television, I would watch the Hobbit cartoon. And, you know, and the books... The Lord of the Rings books were always there on my dad's bookshelf, and I would talk to him about it because I loved The Hobbit and I wanted to read more. And he kept – it's not like he forbid me from reading it till I was older, but he was like, you will enjoy it better if you're a little bit older. And so when I learned that they were making the movies, I was like, now. And that was in my senior to freshman year of college. When you know the announcement came, you know I graduated college and uh, high school in two thousand. I think the movies were announced in nineteen ninety nine, and then the first one was released in two thousand one. And I can't so believe we, you waited that long, honestly. Yeah, and I mean, I read. What's funny is it took me a while to get through the Fellowship of the Ring because the Fellowship of the Ring is the book is it's a slow starter. I don't know what you're talking burn. about. It starts uh, with a party. It does. Well, it starts with a thing about people who like to have parties and then the party, but. I remember staying up all night to finish Return of the King when I ended it, and and then it, like I think a year later the movie came out, and so I mean I've I've been in Tolkien's world almost my entire life, but the Lord of the Rings especially was like my you know transition into adulthood, almost. Mm. How many times did you see it in theaters? Oh God! Listen, it was twenty years ago. It's hard to remember. <laughs> Probably around Just the ballpark. Same, yeah, at least I mean. I was home for winter break when it came out, so probably a lot. So probably five to seven at least. Uh, now, twenty years later, I've probably seen it more than. Have I seen it more than twenty times, probably. I honestly could not say how many times I've seen these films. Uh, so for me, I was sixteen when uh, Fellowship came out in theaters, uh, but my history with Tolkien went back to. Four, the age of four, um, when my father read the entire thing to myself and my brother. He had all of the books in this one beautifully illustrated, um, just huge, massive of all the three books. And it was illustrated by uh, incredible artist, Alan Lean, just everything about that experience from the, the story itself to the art that accompanied it. The entire thing was just so profoundly um, formative to me. Uh, I I revered that book like before I ever knew to like kiss a sedur. I knew the inscription on the one ring before I ever knew the Shema. To me, it was it was everything. And and unlike you, where where you were um, very much into the animated um, 
version. What I was obsessed with from books to when the films came out was actually the BBC uh, adaptation, which was so great, which actually had Ian Holm as um, as Frodo. So great. So I used to be able to recite chunks of that. <laughs> um, but to me, The Lord of the Rings is a fantasy story, yes, but it was absolutely a formative ethical morality tale, a demonstration of being on a path, on a derech, uh, and all the places that that path can take you and how you deal with your obstacles on that journey and how that can vary from person to person. And it also taught me that true acts of chesed or loving kindness are done without expectation of reward. It taught me that claiming a birthright also means claiming responsibility. You want to learn about values, you look at Frodo and his Messiras Nefesh, his self-sacrifice. You look at Sam, the ultimate mensch. Look at Aragorn, who beyond being an Arthurian you know, figure is also, I'd say, a, a messianic one in a lot of ways. The teshuva of Boromir, the beautiful cross-cultural friendship of Legolas and Gimli overcoming prejudice, the sacrifice and rebirth of Gandalf to complete the job he had on Earth. So basically, if you want to be a good person, in my book, uh, you study your Pirke Avot, and you study your Lord of the Rings, and you're pretty good to go. Did you find it ethically formative on you as well? Like, how you believe things should be done in the world? You're like, yeah, Frodo wouldn't have done that. Yes and no. I mean, like, there's the war, the world war that preceded it. The Lord of the Rings is a great example of what one should do in a perfect evil versus good situation. That's true. It's not a lot of gray area here. Yeah. Except there is some gray area if you dig deep I enough. Mean the because, great havens. Well, yeah. But also some of the, some of the systems in the world are yeah. failing, right? Yeah. Gondor is failing, yeah. right? Rohan is troubled. Uh you know, pre Gandalf, uh, you know, freeing uh, the king Theoden from the clutches of Saruman's mind. But, yeah. and we'll, we're, I'm going to talk about this later the isolationist, uh, racist tendencies of the Shire. But even dismissing all of those, like, they all had to come together to yeah. win. They all had to come together and sacrifice and depend upon each other, people they barely knew. Jesse, what parts of the story or the characters, uh, the different cultures or themes in Tolkien's world building, did you initially read as Jewish in the books or films? Well, I think, Miriam, this is where we separate. And I think it's because it of my childhood obsession with The Hobbit and not The Lord of the Rings, is that I'm going to go with the stock answer, is the dwarves. The dwarves, mm. I always read them as kind of Jewish, at least the Jewish avatars of this fantasy universe that I was in. And also the hobbits a little bit. I mean... Interesting, yeah. The, I feel like the hobbits could be a vision of uh, a Jewish community made free from anti-Semitism and just left alone, right? To just do what they like want. That. You know, uh, you know, Judaism has a lot of farming-related holidays, right? Definitely. The, the hobbits would love that. We do love eating. We do love drinking. We do love hanging out. I feel like the other. Hobbits would really love Purim, but they I would, digress. Oh, man. man Purim Hobbit, at the Green Dragon. Hobbit Purim? That would go on for days. Anyway. But, you know, and the way you answer this question also depends on what it is you think Jews are being represented for mm. in stories. And I'm always on the lookout for anti-Semitic tropes, just because... Not because I'm worried about them, but just because it's fun. It's fun for me to like try to point and find out where they are, you know. And just like the the bankers in Harry Potter, right? Oh, they, that's the, an, that's for a different episode. Yeah, yeah, like, it's a whole other episode. The the dwarves, the dwarves' culture, their language, um, their sort of weaknesses and their strengths all seemed kind of either both like. Eastern European Jewish, and then also sometimes like, like classical Israelite faith, mm. you know, uh, tropes where, you know, they are very, like, they are very warlike when they want to be. Um, they obviously have a leadership system. Their language is, is clearly Semitic, like yeah. Tolkien says that many times. Um, the beards. The beards. Oh, the beards, right? And of course, like, the. Love of shiny things. Now, here's the thing. Everyone loves shiny things. That's not a Jewish trait. Um, but if you think about 
the way dwarves exist in Middle Earth, right? Mm -hmm. They both by going after the things they want, which are, you know, precious gems and stones and whatnot. They're also protecting themselves by hiding themselves in a mountain, right? Like those mountain halls are kind of just like really fancy in mountain shtetls. So the fanciest, the fanciest shtetl, yeah. High class shtetl. But it's a shtetl by choice, not right. So it's, it's a, it's a self isolating shtetl situation. Uh, I, I like not Shittle, a Cossacks yeah. imposing. Yeah. I like Shtetl by choice. Uh, that's, that's, yeah. I like that one. Yeah. I want that on a shirt. <laughs> that's actually, yes, look out for that in our um, merchandise that we don't have. Yeah. I mean, and especially, real quickly, especially in a story that's so heavily focused on English and like yeah. Nordic folklore, yeah. you always have a sense that there's going to be like a low lying level of just not like real anti Semitism, but just like generic anti Semitic tropes about. About Jews, because even you know, and we'll get into this later. Like, you can you can have racist thoughts about a group, but still like that group, and they come out in interesting, you know. But they'll come out in almost like subconscious ways. And for right. me, I feel like that's what, especially the dwarves of the Hobbit, because you spend more time with them. Yeah, um, definitely are the most you know Jewish esque if viewed if viewed from non Jews, I guess. So. If viewed from an entirely looking at it solely for like anti-Semitic tropes, yeah. But I think also, like as you're saying, it does depend on how also I view myself or readers view themselves and see themselves in the characters in the in the story. For so, for example, I was like before I was aware of sort of the classic anti-Semitic tropes. I always, as a child, so right, I'm I'm listening to this. I'm four. I'm five. Whatever. I was really certain that the elves were the Jews uh, because they had this ancient culture. Literature was their whole jam. They were in a diaspora from their homeland. They were always walking around in the in the woods doing hitchbo to doot, uh, which is a, a sort of like isolating conversation with the spiritual, you know, whatever. And and all of them had L names like Galadriel, right, Tanuviel. And I was like, oh, yeah obviously the same thing as Michael or Gavriel, which are the Hebrew word similar equivalents, but an L meaning God. Um, and at the end, they all make al- Aliyah to the undying land. So I was like, oh, yeah, yeah, Jewish. And I always envisioned Rivendell as like a physical representation of the concept of Shabbat, um, a bubble mm, okay. in time and space, like a protected bubble in time of sp- in time and space that... Um, you know, where, where you're safe for the moment. In rewatching and rereading over the past year, thematically, the concept of the Yetzer Hara, which is the evil or selfish inclination within each of us, and the Yetzer Tov, which is the positive good inclination, uh, was really highlighted for me. Um, they all face this internal battle between these instincts because what is the one ring other than a physical manifestation of the Yetzer Hara? That's my read on that. I mean, the ring itself is, is a fascinating uh, thing to try to view through a Jewish lens. Like, yeah. Because one, like it's a gold ring, so fancy. Uh, so if you're going with the uh, dwarves or Jews, you're like, ooh, ring. But like, hey, all the, we're going to get into this later. But all of those peoples had rings. They all had magic rings. They they, they did all the have dwarves. magic rings. Uh, I like the idea that the ring itself, that. Uh, I mean, this theory is probably old, but I recently discovered it. The idea that Gollum, the personality, is actually the personality of the ring itself. Oh, and wow! That the longer someone holds the ring, the more that becomes like it, the more the more that that Gollum personality invades and steals. The, well, it's the, not the Gollum personality; it's the ring personality. The ring, ring the ring personality, yes, and uh, which makes the sort of movie arguments between uh, Smeagol and Gollum a little more interesting. I mean, they're interesting no matter what, but I like the idea that the ring itself, the ring yeah. was, right, they, the way they talk about the ring, it has all of this evil power to it. So, like, of course, it would kind of have some kind now, of, like, consciousness. Are you saying that it has the personality of Sauron or its own thing? I think, theory, I think that's an even yeah. more interesting idea is that it has yeah. its own, it is an inanimate object with sentience. I think the theory is, like, as so the way Sauron created it and how it existed once Sauron lost physical form, it is its own consciousness separate from Sauron, which I, I don't know. I, I, I would love a, an exploration of that idea that because that's, 
because then it's just not a it's not a passive evil thing. It's an active evil thing. Well, clearly it is active. It, yeah. It, and I mean, that's very much highlighted in the film. They, oh, yeah. they make it even more <laughs> obvious that like during the Council of Elrond, yeah, it's just like, sitting in the middle being like, I'm causing trouble, causing trouble. Yeah, it's trouble. like, yes. Yeah, it's like, yes, hate each other. Um, yes. It's exactly, it's like, oh, I'm doing great today. Can I ask you a question? Yeah, please do. So, one of the biggest differences between the books and the movies, to me, yeah, is the is how the character of Aragorn is presented, yes. how what that character mm. thinks of mm. himself. Yeah, because and I always forget every time I go back and read the books, I'm like, Aragorn's real arrogant, and I'm like, I don't like this version of Aragorn. He, the book Aragorn to me always mm. felt like he knew what his destiny was and was just waiting, waiting for, waiting for the right time to start it. Where the book Aragorn is more like a, I would say, a Hebrew Bible protagonist that is constantly questioning himself, unsure of his destiny, not not, not knowing if he's worth it or not. And yeah. until he sort of accepts the sword and goes into the mountain, blah, blah, blah. But I, I always thought that was a more sort of, maybe not uh, Judaic, but a more ancient way of telling that protagonist story. Because... And maybe I'm wrong, that, but that, that's, that's how I feel about how Aragorn in the book is. I think when you go back and read the appendices in the end of Return of the King, you do get a sense of, um, and even when reading some other stuff about like in the Silmarillion, the fall of Numenor and that whole line, you get a sense of the incredible burden that's been on Aragorn since, like talk about guilt, like Jewish guilt. He's got that. Um, you know, he's... 89, I think, at the time of, mm -hmm. of fellowship, he's lived an entire life. He has served in Gondor. He has served in Rohan. He has put in all this effort, um, not only because it is his destiny, quote unquote, but because that is the only he, he doesn't think he's you know, he doesn't actually know about um, the role he's going to play when he's very young. And then he finds out about it and it changes the whole trajectory of his life. Um, that he is now, that's his obligation to do. And if he doesn't do that, not only will the entire world fall into chaos, um, but he will lose the thing that's most important to him in the entire world, which is Arwen. Uh, and I think he comes off as really confident to members of the fellowship, but I don't, I think that's how they perceive him. Mm -hmm. I don't think that's actually how he comes off, especially when he's, you know, off with Legolas and Gimli sort of, as you get to book two and three, you kind of do see him questioning his decisions, wondering if he's doing the right thing. And even in the in the um, the the films as well, you get a better sense of that he's struggling. He yeah. he doesn't know exactly how the right thing, but he knows he has to do it. But he's not sure if it's the right moment. Like, ah, uh, he's going yeah. through a lot. He's got a lot of angst. Yeah, um, yeah. The, the, I think that's how he's yeah. presenting, though. I think that's his his whole facade. I mean, the the movies don't make a huge deal out of it, but they're yeah. constantly, especially in the two towers. There's like a power struggle sort of between him oh, and Theoden, yeah. leading up to the battle, until eventually Theoden's like, "Please help me." <laughs> and and then he says, "In you know, in Return of the King, it wasn't Theoden who saved his people," and you know. But I, I always found I found, and, and maybe it's just like you know through the eyes of other characters. Yeah. But I mean, my favorite. Oh, and I can't quote it exactly. My favorite part from the book yeah. is there's a moment when Aragorn has to say all of his names. And it's like a whole paragraph <laughs> of Aragorn's names. And I'm like... Daenerys Targaryen. Yeah. <laughs> like, <laughs> yeah. yeah. Breaker of chains. Uh, you know. Mother of dragons. Yeah, Khaleesi yeah. of the Great Grass Sea. Yeah. yeah. It's that scene. But it's like... I'm like, yeah. I was like... I don't even remember half of those names. Like those are oh, new. He's never said those before. It's so funny because in when I was just watching, I was rewatching Fellowship last night, and in the scene in Rivendell when they are having the the meeting, the council meeting, mm -hmm. and Boromir is being a dick, and Legolas yeah. stands up, he's like, "Don't you know who this is? You owe him your allegiance." And Aragorn's like, "Sit down, sit down." Yeah, Legolas, like, sit down, sit down, sit down. This is Isildur's heir, and heir to the throne of Gondor. Have a bad, Legolas. Gondor has no king. Gondor needs no king. So he doesn't want people yeah, to be like, Yeah, ex-nay on the king, on the right, e right. Shh, shh, shh. 
um, bring it down. Let's, let's bring it down. Yeah. And it's he downplays it a lot. Uh, I think that that's fair because um, it's really awkward. And I think the movie highlights the Boromir stuff really, really strongly and how like how contentious that whole thing like, oh, you're telling me that the heir has returned? Well, what has he done for us? Because and Boromir doesn't know that Aragorn has served for a really long time. Yeah. Actually yeah. in Gondor. He does, he has no awareness of that. Boromir's He's just a reactions random are, outsider guy. Yeah. Boromir's Legit. actions are yeah. They're Legit. justified. They're completely they're justified. justified. Yeah. Uh, I don't mind it. I would yeah. ask those questions too. Yeah. Be like yeah. who the F is this guy? Right. But honestly I think to your point about is Aragorn a more biblical hero? No, because he's not flawed enough. He's not flawed. He, it's true. That's he's not about flaws. He's too he good. He doesn't. He has flaws, but they are not the flaws that we see, uh, like King David level flaws. True. True. That's, yeah. We don't I, have that. We are not yeah. seeing that kind of activity from Aragorn. Thankfully. Yeah, he, well, yeah. I mean, he's too much of a. He's a good dude. <laughs> he's too much of an Arthurian legend type to have. David, uh, King David, and you know we've talked about this on various uh, episodes, sort of tangentially. T- King David, not a good dude. No, no, very, very flawed, um, and that's part of the whole thing about him. However, it it means that Aragorn is not along those lines. He just can't. He's not flawed enough. Yeah. Uh, to merit that kind yeah. of comparison. Yeah, I think the, that that brings me back just real quickly, and then we can move on to the other yeah. questions we've yeah. actually written. Your idea that elves were Jews, yeah. the reason why I never thought that was elves aren't, they're not self-critical enough, right? They're too, they're too good at things, <gasps> right? I, I would never, as a Jewish person, think another Jew would be like, yeah, I'm going to skateboard down this shield shoot, while shooting arrows at I people. I don't think you, I think that's, you know, I'm just going to say that. I think that's a very American Jewish attitude. Uh, yes, definitely. Yes. I th- I don't think I think Listen, that's that yeah. is of this community. Hashtag not all Jews. Not all Jews. I think like so other Jews of different parts of the world or different experience. I'd be like, yeah, I could believe that. Oh yeah, like just uh, because America- Israelis Israelis right. could totally, totally. believe that. Hundred percent, they would have slid down yeah, on but, that shield yeah. at the Hornburg, firing a bazillion arrows. Yeah, but Eastern European Ashkenazic Jews, not so no, much. No, no, we wouldn't. <laughs> So. Okay, so so I, you know, we kind of talked about this a little bit, but I was wondering to myself what uh, fellowship characters, or, or for, through the whole uh, Lord of the Rings, actually, had, you know, if they had favorite Jewish rituals or objects or things, what would they be? And I'd love to get your thoughts on this. So this is what I came up with. Um, the Ents clearly love Tubishvat. Clearly. Obviously. Uh, Boromir loves Yom Kippur because not only does he get the opportunity to atone for some mistakes he made, but he gets to sound a shofar a lot. The Horn of Gondor. Boromir. Rest in peace. Yeah. Boromir. Elves pretty much invented Sukkot. I mean, look at Lothlorien. It's not halachically a sukkah, but... The vibe is there. It yeah. is a sukkah. There are just a zillion sukkahs up in trees. Um, hobbits love Shabbat. They're all interesting, and there are mandated meals. You must have me- these certain meals during Shabbat. It is mandated. Second breakfast, um, sudash lishit, all, it's all in there. Gentlemen, we do not stop till nightfall. What about breakfast? We've already had it. We've had one, yes. What about second breakfast? And I'm pretty sure that Gollum actually loves Rosh Chodesh because it's the time when there is the least amount of moon visible, That's, as yes. he hates any source of light. And I will say, I am convinced that Gandalf the Grey runs on Jewish time because he is a Robe Hasidic rabbi. He is the Baal Shem Tov. A wizard is never late, nor is he early. He arrives precisely when he means to. So what do you think? Uh, do you agree? Or what else? What other things may I have missed? Uh, I would say both the hobbits and the dwarves, and honestly, maybe even the elves would love Purim, like being able to like dress up and the groggers, and I can imagine those t- the Peter Jackson's kids who show up in every film, like oh, yeah. loving to play the God, the that that daughter of theirs has just such expressive eyes. Anyway, I would also say the uh, uh, the Rohirrim, the mm-hmm. the citizens of Rohan, love the high holidays. I mean. 
There's a yes. scene in Return of the King. They literally do uh, a Takiya Gadola right before charging down <gasps> Pelennor Fields. It's like, hoo hoo. And it's just like, and they hold it and it's great. It's- <laughs> I know it's a I great cried deal. every single damn time in the it theater that I saw that. Every time. And I didn't even know they were screaming death until the, oh, in the last yeah. couple of years. I just and thought in they the were book, screaming. it's death, ride to ruin, and the world's ending. And I'm like, yeah. oh, that's metal. Yeah. yeah. It's like, death. Anyway, <laughs> that would have been a fun day on set. But, you know, I, I agree with you. And also, I think, you know, clearly. Um, Gondor was established by Jews because they do use the whole lighting the beacons thing. It's from the Talmud. Yeah. Go look it up. We invented that. Thanks for ripping that off, Gondor. So this might only be a movie-related thing, but I think Denethor, the last steward of Gondor, would like the mikvah because he likes to pour um, liquids all over himself. Yeah, Instead of oil. It would also put out the fire. Mm -hmm. (laughs) Okay, but also I hate Denethor, but yes. Yeah. But yes. again, like great casting on Denethor. Like that great guy can casting. De- that yes. guy can deliver r- ridiculous lines with oh, such gravitas. Oh, I mean, there's so much. If we would talk about all the movies, I, I have so much to go into about uh, Return of the King and the way they betrayed Eowyn, my yes. beloved. But we're not going to go into that. L- like listeners, viewers, however you're watching this, <laughs> if you want us to talk about the other you, two movies, in we're the, get, it, we'd happy to do it. We'd be happy to do it. Just make sure you know to like and subscribe and to download this episode if you want right. to hear us talk more about the two towers because I can literally talk about the two towers all oh, day. Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. Do that and also you know send us a, a message, a podcast at jewishboston.com. We would love to hear what you think is Jewish about Lord of the Rings while we're at it. So. Yeah. Yeah, and if you want us to talk about the other three movies and then the three Hobbit movies, Listen, let us know. Listen, we can know. do that too. I mean, that would be more of a punishment on our part, but... I feel like there's a lot to talk about about Zionism when it comes to the three Hobbit Ooh, movies. Oh, yes. But, yes. So we'll get to that whenever right. we do those episodes. So anyway, let's let's get back to this pod for a hot right. second. We've talked about our impressions. Uh, let's see how that kind of stacks up against what Tolkien himself had to say about the influence of Jews and Judaism on his work. Now, before I reveal some actual real quotes from Tolkien, um, I know that you and I had a very different perception initially about what we thought he would have said. Um, We had different takes. I think that you initially thought he may have been an anti-Semite. And I was like, what? Yeah. So I think here's the issue. Like, uh, if, if you study, say, like, you know, the history of American anti-Semitism, right? Mm-hmm. There's the idea of the Jew you know versus the international Jew, right? The, oh, the Jew like of... Oh, 007, your... I'm the international Jew. Well, yeah, I mean, there's the there's the idea of, like, the... of of the Jews outside of the one or two Jews you might know. Oh, and you I... mean, like, theoretical Jews versus yeah, yeah. real and Jews I... you've met. And I, especially w- with English authors or United Kingdom authors... Considering that Jews have been kicked out of England multiple times, yeah, there is a sense that you can like Jews or and be interested in Judaic history, mm-hmm. but still kind of because you don't interact with them that much, have the sort of built in stereotypes that develop over time. And I feel Tolkien is one of those. Like I have no doubt if 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 Jews were presented to him and they were in danger, he would protect them. Yeah. Right. But I also know subconsciously he has inherited a long line of base level uh, Jewish stereotypes that aren't necessarily positive. And so that's, I yeah. think that's what I was trying to say and then just not saying it yeah. very well. I mean, I think even when, you know, we see this now that people think stereotypes and when they talk about them, they're like, this is a positive thing. Why are you guys saying this is a stereotype? Um, not, not understanding that just because they admire that stereotype, like they they aspire to the thing that Jews are stereotyped as being, so they think about it in admiration, as which doesn't take away from the part that it is in fact a stereotype. I think we're about to get into this part, which is yeah. like Tolkien's life study, right, was yeah. on um, old languages and yeah. old things, and so I kind of feel like his his knowledge of Judaism is very almost ancient. In a way, where well, I like doubt- his knowledge of Beowulf. Yeah, 
<laughs> right? Like, I don't think he knew that many, like, 20th century British Jews, right? I, you know what? I don't know. Yeah. If anyone listening happens to know if Tolkien had some Jewish friends, please yeah. do let us know. I'd and, be really uh, interested to find out. Yeah. D- don't give me, like, he had one Jewish friend. Like, that's not what we're looking for. No, here. we're looking for two or more. Yes. We're, we're looking for a quarter of a minion. <laughs> right. We're looking for eight other, like nine. Uh, we are looking for a fellowship. Yes. Um, so these these are good points, Jesse. So what we we do know is that Tolkien made some very clear statements against Nazism, um, against Jew hatred. In thirty eight, uh, this German publisher wanted to find out. Tolkien, are you Jewish? Like before we publish your book yep. here in Germany, yep. how German are you? He's like, okay, so you're asking if I'm Jewish. And basically what I want to tell you is that I'm just sorry I'm not. He said, if I just understand what you are inquiring, that I'm of the Jewish origin, I can only reply that I regret that I appear to have no ancestors of that gifted people. Look, I know yeah. he's he's saying he's putting us in this othering category. He's othering yeah. us by that. And yet he's saying, I wish I was them. Um, so yeah. I don't mind that yeah. he said that. Uh, and True, also, but also, no, yeah. yeah. yeah we're, not all, we're not all gifted. What are you so, talking about, Jesse? Shh, shh, I shut mean, up. Don't tell people The that. two of us are. Shh, but... Of course, obviously, incredibly gifted. We're all incredibly gifted. Um, but he, he hated uh, Hitler. He hated him. He described it as a burning private grudge between the two of them because... Because he was so infatuated, Tolkien was so infatuated with um, Scandinavian, old old English, Anglo-Saxon cultures, um, and he felt that Hitler was absolutely perverting this and making this into this horrible, horrible thing of of um, discrimination. Where he's like, "No, I've made my, this my life's work, and you are polluting it with these horrific racist uh, ideas or using it to back your ideology." Um, so I respect, I absolutely respect that. Like. He absolutely did, though, use these stereotypes, as you mentioned. I think, actually, there was a point between The Hobbit and Lord of the Rings where he kind of revised some of the stuff that he was talking about because he saw the way in which people were perceiving it. Um, But he clearly did conceive of the dwarves as being Jewish. Um, uh, The language of the dwarves entirely built on Hebrew using the three a letter root system. Okay, I did not realize this, but I'm I'm fascinated by this. At the Battle of the Hornburg and Two Towers, uh, Gimli yells Baruch Hazad, like you, like Baruch Hashem. So I'm not actually going to be using that interchangeably with Baruch Hashem going forward, because um, I think that's amazing. And in in fifty five, he wrote, "I do think of the dwarves like Jews, at once native and alien to their habitations." Speaking the language of the country, but with an accent due to their own private tongue, there's a tremendous love of the artifact and, of course, the immense warlike capacity of the Jews, which we tend to forget nowadays. And I know people might look at this quote and say, nah, but I love it. I think it's fairly accurate. I'll take it. Because clearly, Tolkien hasn't forgotten about Masada. He's not forgotten about the Maccabees or Bar Kokhba. So he's keeping it real. Jesse, what did you think about that? And again, I think this quote goes to my earlier theory that the Tolkien is viewing Jews as the Israelites of the Bible and not modern day Jews mm. or modern day Jews to him. Because as my friend, who I'm going to shout out here, Professor Jason Gaines, uh, now at Tulane University, points out that the Israelite religion, as he calls it, and rabbinic Judaism are clearly two different religions. Right. And we, well, we try that's to, we, a whole five other episodes, yes. Jesse. But let's, moving past that uh, that point is that th- the culture and history of the Jews in Israel in our Bible is incredibly violent and warlike. I mean, we were constantly having to invade places to go back to where God is telling us to go. And yeah, God's telling us to go, so we think it's okay, but we're still invading places. Yeah. And fighting people. I mean, we've talked about this every every single time we have like a Jewish holiday and we're talking about Mount Sinai, any situation, how incredibly violent it is and how often when it's adapted in, in cinematic versions, they kind of leave that out because it makes yeah. people feel icky. But I, I, I also wonder, though, violent, though, I mean, I would love I wish someone asked him the follow up question, which is, what does he mean by like warlike capacity? Is he talking about um, he means we're badass? That's what he means. Well, yeah, but he could also be talking about the early 20th century notion that Jews were behind all of the world wars. 
If that were true, okay, he served in. So why would if he if that were true, mm-hmm. and he really believed that, he would not be saying this stuff. Like you know what? I'm sorry, I'm not a Jew. I I just I just I'm not sure about that one. Does true, true, maybe. I mean, again, like uh, it was a different time. It but was a like, different time. I mean, as far as British authors at the time go, pretty not anti-Semitic, right? Like, right? let's view There's him in worse. the context of. Yeah, yes. exactly. So, so right. We can't expect a level of uh, yeah. social awareness yeah. that we would from anybody now. So, I think you know, overall, I'll take it. Yeah. No, I'm. I'm. I like. I'm. I'm a Tolkien fan. Yeah. He seemed like a really good dude. Yeah. I would love to hang out with him. I'm down with that. But he also spent all of his time on ancient, old languages and cultures. So his views of, I would, I would say, almost all faith, world faith and cultures, is going to be a little skewed towards, you know, two thousand years prior. Just a smidge, yeah. just a smidge, but it kind of tracks for the you know yeah. his creation of the entire Middle Earth as a world from yeah. Bereshit, like from Genesis, essentially yeah. in the Silmarillion <gasps> down. Ooh, ooh! So the, uh, we talked about the work warlike capacity. We forgot to talk yes. about the love of the artifact part of that quote, uh, which I yes. find fascinating. Yes. Okay, listen. You all listening and watching, we as Jews love objects. We literally talk about objects all the time. We use objects in every ritual. Think about, think about every Torah you've seen. You know the yah that you use to read the Torah, the dressings of the Torah, the mezuzah, your tefillin, the all the the all the Passover stuff. Right? We are a ritualistic religion, and rituals require usually items, and so we kind of do love artifacts. So, and I'm there's no saying. shame in that game. People. Ark of the Covenant, my friends. Yeah. God, they, like, like <laughs> if you want to go back and hear about uh, Judaism's obsession with artifacts, read about the what the Ark of the Covenant is made out of and how much gold and blah blah blah. Like they talk about it. For it's pages. all in the Torah. It's, it's all the in there. Read yeah. it. Don't at read me. Read it. Yeah. <laughs> Come back and complain later after you've yes. read the entire Torah. Um. So yeah, I mean, I entirely agree that the accusation of dwarves being so greedy. Look, the whole story is about greed. The whole story is about how greed is almost inescapable for everybody. Um, the whole story is about greed and how it can corrupt literally everybody from the elves. That's why they are exiled in the first place. Um, greed is heavily exploited by Morgoth and Sauron throughout the entire world and story. The greed that men experience is the reason that we have Nazgul. Um, Because they had those shiny, shiny rings they couldn't say no to. So dwarves are not special in that regard, nor do I (laughs) really... For those who are listening, Jesse just pulled out uh, his ring. (laughs) Yeah, this is actually my wedding ring. It's his Uh, wedding ring, but it looks a lot like the one ring. It is made by the same people who made... The, the ring from the films, which is why we got it. Are you it. serious? Yeah. Yeah. And, Damn, uh, okay, I did not know. Uh, I, I doubt wow. You can... Does it have an inscription in the... Yeah, but Have not, you thrown not... it into the fire? I have not has it come it out fire cool, yet. I have not, but with I words have not on yet. it. It's luckily not like straight gold, so it looks slightly different. Um, wow. I but didn't I... know that, Jesse. That is fascinating. Yeah. Yeah, listen. Real real high-level nerdery over here. So... <laughs> We have. I haven't even shown uh, my Gandalf. Okay, we should probably much. talk about this point: the fact that Jesse did, in fact, go to New Zealand, visit. Look, that's okay. Jesse's now showing us the the Gandalf staff replica. So he has lived the dream here. He went to Hobbiton. Um, he's truly next leveling the nerddom. I appreciate that, Bob. You, <laughs> Jesse. That's that's very cool. One day after the pandemic, I too yes. will go. The whole story, everyone is being greedy, right? Yeah. I mean, the Council of Elrond is all about each group not wanting to one not wanting to give power or ability to another group, but also not wanting anybody to do it. Right. 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 And the you know, the dwarves are viewed as the greedy ones, but let's talk about the elves for a second. Who are like oh, Yeah, we'd yeah. Lo- we'd love to help, but we're leaving, so you're gonna have to do <laughs> this on your own. <laughs> And like, no, we're not going to tell you like how to do magic or how to make magical weapons that you have to find in caves earlier in the story. To, right. Uh, you know, and we're so we're just going to like, good luck because we got to go. And I'm like, like, here, have a magical flashlight. Bye. Yeah. Yeah. Here, have a ha- have a plant. I mean, they're entirely so egotistical. I mean, the whole movie begins with Galadriel doing the voiceover, and she's and she's talking about how the rings were given out. She's like, mm-hmm. and three were given out to the elf lords, wisest and best looking and richest and most fab. 
It began with the forging of the Great Rings. Three were given to the Elves, immortal, wisest, and fairest of all beings. All right, so, yeah, settle down. I mean, listen, calm down, lady. Yeah, I mean, listen, I love Gladriel, but like, I do too. I you do couldn't too. teach Frodo how to do just like a little magic? No. Like, it would uh-uh. have been useful. That's all I'm saying. It, that just ruins the plot, Jesse. I know. Um, so, yeah, totally oh, not helpful oh, about it. Eagles, also selfish. So. <laughs> if you have a problem with the eagle story in Lord of the Rings, do not talk to us about it. Go complain yes. to the estate of J.R.R. Tolkien. Yes, we know there are in-universe reasons why the eagles don't show up uh, only at the most – okay, at the, only at the most dramatic parts. But here's the thing. Yeah. Everyone in the story is kind of a drama queen. They're always showing up at the last second, making the most dramatic. Well, definitely Rohirrim, definitely Gandalf when he shows up at Hornburg. Okay, that's true. It's yeah. true. Yeah. Uh, you know, you got a point. The Witch King of Angmar, like, he is a drama queen. Oh, he loves to make an entrance. I want to acknowledge that Tolkien was, in his way, a writer of Midrash, Anglo-Saxon Midrash. He also coined the term the cauldron of story. So it it shouldn't be surprising to us at all that he um pulled so much from the history uh, of the Jews and other groups. I don't want to say it was just the Jews. It's inspired by so many different groups and historical events. Um, but in doing the research for this uh, this episode, I discovered that a lot of the Silmarillion, um, particularly the section that deals with the fall of Numenor, is also very explicitly from uh, Jewish religion and history. So I don't assume that everybody who has watched the films has read the Silmarillion. <clears throat> I would highly recommend it, though. Uh, so there's some good stuff in there, but I do want to mention it. So Numenorean language, partially also based on Hebrew. Um, the word uh, Adunaic is based on Adon, Lord. Adon Olam, it's what it's from. Um, Tolkien compared the Numenorians to Jews in the use of a central temple, like the temple in Jerusalem, although what happened to it is not the same what happened to Numenor. It does have some parallels a little bit. Um, and confirmed my initial theory that growing up that the elves all had Jewish names with L is in fact true. That was a an actual thing that Tolkien did intentionally. Um, Galadriel, Tanuviel, El Bereth all used that. And words like uh, Rohirrim um, and Haradrim also use the plural Hebrew suffix. Um, so that's really very interesting. I did find in this article that I read called Jewish Influences in Middle Earth by Zach Kramer, they have a really great insight in there, which I had never um, thought of. So the two trees in the Silmarillion, they give off light to the world until they're destroyed. Mm-hmm. Um, and then the sun and moon are created. <laughs> I, it's quite... I, I am familiar with the story of the Simrils. Okay, good, good. I'm glad. So so for anybody listening, you actually, if anybody's following the current adaptation for the um, Amazon television series, they did release a promotional image, uh, which featured, in fact, the two trees. So I, I hope we see more about that. Um, but so Kramer is making the point that in Talmudic tradition, there's a Sohar, a jewel containing a magic light, the light of the world to come, the light of Valinor. Um And the Noah takes it to provide light during the 40 days of flood, according to Midrashic legend. And it also becomes the eternal light in the temple in Jerusalem. And Kramer brings up the point that that bears more than a small resemblance to the Silmarils themselves and Eirendil, the mariner, being Noah. And I just think that's a really cool reading of that that never occurred to me. It just goes to show you there's there's no new stories to be written. There's no (laughs) new Everything has been done before. Um, so, Jesse, I know we mentioned this earlier for a hot second when we were talking about the ring as its own independent, sentient being. Um, so there are nine members of the Fellowship, and I know it's to match the nine ring race. I get it. Okay. But they're so close to a minion. Um, if you had to choose a tenth member to make a minion out of the fellowship who would it be and why and that's if we're assuming we're not counting bill the pony i feel like even though this minion would include supernatural beings and whatnot Mm -hmm. i still feel like some rabbi is going to give us some clap back on having a pony in there so so again if we're we're trying to use a real life example here like if we're in a rush and we need that 10th person star minion like are we in Bree are we in Rivendell I guess that's true are you going out in Gondor being like are you Jewish are you Jewish 
I'll tell you who I would. I, who would you pick? In a pinch. Okay. This is this is book related. I can't Go. remember his Go name. With it. But yeah. in The Return of the King, there is a okay. Gondorian soldier who has a son. Yes. Like, son who hangs out with oh. Pippin a lot. That guy, that soldier seemed like a really good dude. He was and I'd a want good him. dude. And I'd want him. Who He technically gets punished for abandoning his post. I but feel like, like his name was something related to Baron. Or the son's related with something related yeah. to Baron. You know uh, what? We're going to have to look that up. And I, I'm embarrassed that I don't know. But I don't. I, I but I know also, of yeah. whom you speak. Yes. I would also yeah. say, like, I feel like Theoden would be a really solid member of a minion. I yeah. feel like even if he didn't know what was going on, he would uh, he would just, like, match what everyone else is doing. Yeah. So. I think that's a good... I think, like, if they're wandering through the wilderness, maybe Radagast could yeah. show up to make the minion. Ooh. Ooh. You know? Also, also the guy who owns the uh, Prancing Pony, because he would have no idea what's going on, and he probably oh, didn't... Oh, Barley and Butterbur? Yeah. He, he's I not Jewish. It, I don't think he's Jewish. I, well, I don't think any of these characters. Well, I, I think the dwarves are Jewish. No, the elves are <laughs> Jewish. We've got over this. My yes. God, They're, everybody's Jewish, um, except Barley and Butterbur from Bree. Yeah. Um, also, the uh, the character uh, his name begins with a G, but uh, the orc who uh, wants their legs, who wants Marion Pippin's legs. I think he would be fun. Oh my God! You know, there was a time in my life when I knew what that guy was named. G- Gornak? Gurlak? Nope. nope. I have I have a figure nope. of him uh, on my Lord of the Rings chest. Grishnak? Anyway. No. Is it Grishnak? Grishnak. Okay, I would like points from anybody. Thank you, Jesse, uh, for the points. Insert DJ Airhorn noise. No. <laughs> <laughs> I sure hope that I was correct. Um, so yeah, I, I mean, I I agree with you. I think that those How could be you? very. Oh, yeah. I mean, other than Radagast, I feel like who's a spiritual kind of. Mm person that you i mean tom bombadil might if he shows he, up he just wander off though he just but he off wouldn't the show up he'd be like i need a minion uh and he'd be like okay i'll be there and then six months later he would show up mm, yeah also like really pretty much any other dwarf character we run into i, I just feel like dwar- dwarves in general being, yeah. being the jews of the story in my yeah. view uh could really just kick ass out of a nagoon if you need oh to, just yes like... i mean if you if you hear them saying mm-hmm. in the, the first mm-hmm. hobbit movie I had chills. Yes. Yeah. Just thinking about it right now. I, I agree. I think that you're onto something there. Yeah. So I would like to share a line, a quote from Fellowship of the Ring that I found so very, very relevant over this past year. And I think a lot of other fans maybe agree. I know I spent this past year, I, I did an entire reread of... Silmarillion, Lord of the Rings, the whole shebang, Children of Horan, like anything that I could technically find, um, I read. Okay, so Frodo says how he wishes the ring had never come to him and he didn't have to deal with any of the horrible things that he will have to deal with personally, that he will have to face. And Gandalf says, so do all who live to see such times, but that is not for us to decide. All we have to decide is what to do with the time that is given to us. I think that's a really profound and very Jewish um, teaching. We do not have to complete the work, but we have to begin it. Um, We can't really choose what's going on in the world, but we can choose our response. Like Frodo and the Fellowship, we can decide to step forward bravely in our own lives and demonstrate personal responsibility and care for others, despite what's happening externally in the world. I think that Gandalf would be like, yeah, wear a goddamn mask or do not pass. I, 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 believe, I believe he'd be a fan of collective action to I do solve too. a problem. I think so, too. So, Jesse, did you have any lessons or quotes from the film that you felt are particularly applicable for our current time in history. Yeah, I mean, so you live with these stories so long that your views of some of the characters and groups you meet change over time. Yeah. And I used to just, like, love the Hobbits. Like, I sounded, felt like Hobbits are living, like, everyone's best life. They're just chilling, farming, yeah. Yeah. eating, drinking, smoking. Yeah. But over time, though, I was kind of soured on them, like, as a culture, and only because they're so... What's great about them is also what's wrong with them. They are oh. they are insular. They do not care about the greater world. They are being protected and not knowing it, thinking they're just safe because of reasons. And they don't want to know. Yeah. They don't they don't care to know. And I think uh in an age where we are all connected, having a a group of people who are like, We don't care about you and don't wanna know. We're just yeah. dealing with our own stuff. That's not healthy and not good for the world. And 
I feel like Tolkien agreed because he kind of the entire story is about hobbits who do care and leave. Yeah. And, you know, again, not in the movies, but in the books, save the Shire at the end. Yeah. Never hashtag never forget burning of the Shire. I never will. <sighs> anyway. I think that's a very astute point that those who do go for a more, I don't want to say nationalist, but isolationist approach, uh, unfortunately, they pay for it at the end yeah. uh, and, of the story, which is, of course, not in the films, but is a maybe the most important part and the most important lesson in the books happens after the destruction of the ring in what happens when you think you are out of the crisis, when you are out of the worst case scenario and you find how profoundly um, the world has shifted to the negative. And, you know, the hobbits are are isolationists out of ignorance. The ants are isolationists out of just like long history of I think sadness. they're just like, yeah, and they move, and you know, they're just like... They move slowly. Our women left! Oh, God! Why yeah, but, should we go anywhere? But none of us thought it would be a good idea to like draw a picture of them so we could remember what they look like. What would they draw on? Ooh. Is it paper? Uh, stone. Stone tablets, right? They could do that. With, okay, maybe. They're magical tree Have creatures. Have you seen this ant wife? <laughs> yeah, she like, looks like a tree. Yeah. She looks just like me, but more curves, I guess? I don't know. We never know. We, we don't, don't know. know. We don't know, we don't know. and know. neither do they. Yeah. But like, as if, if we're talking about quotes, as Mary says them, I'm not sure if it happens both in the book and the film. I know it happens in the film. Is Mary points out that the ants are part of this world. And if they are part of it, aren't they also duty bound to protect it? So, mm. Takun Olam... Uh, throughout the story. Yes, absolutely. Uh, Jesse, thank you for joining me on this uh, quest through Middle Earth and time and space. As we've discussed before, you are the Mary to my AON, not the film AON, obviously the book one. Um, thank you for being here. And also thank you for stabbing the Witch King of Angmar in the back of the leg that time. Death! Yeah, you are always welcome. <sighs> Baruch Hazad and Baruch Hashem. Thank you to everybody out there for listening, especially if you are in the Jewish nerd diagram, Venn diagram with Jesse and I in the center with Judaism and uh, fantasy and sci-fi composing the circles. If you like this episode, be sure to rate and review The Vibe of the Tribe wherever you listen to pods and follow at Jewish Boston on social media. I'd like to dedicate this episode to my father who read me The Lord of the Rings. May we meet again in the Undying Lands.